thank you for watching uh, this video or starting to watch this video, I guess I should say. Um, many of you are early in your career right now and you're at a stage where you are just trying to derotate teeth and that would be in the round night tie phase. And I'm a big, big fan and a big believer of trying to get through this phase as, as efficiently as you possibly can, which would mean as quickly as you possibly can uh, without harming the patient and still doing a great job. So in this presentation, it's it could be rather long. So I broke it into two pieces. Uh, it might surprise you to learn that in 2019, the average attention span of most people was 12 seconds. And then as of last year, it dropped down to eight seconds. So that's why I'm trying to keep this presentation a little bit shorter than my last couple of them. Uh, although it won't be anywhere near eight seconds, trust me on that one. So I just wanted to let you know. And as I said, most of you are uh, that might be watching this or kind of early in your career. I presented a couple of topics that were of special interest to you folks who are just beginning to do ortho. And I think that's a very important time. So you get up started off on the right foot. So uh, without further um, explanation, let's just jump into the PowerPoint so that we can get to work on today's topic. So I'll share this screen with you now um, regarding rotations. And those of you who had me in a lecture or seen me probably uh, before have probably seen this. I use this uh, presentation very, very frequently to talk about uh, derotation of teeth. So forgive me if you've seen this before, but it's definitely worth uh, worth watching again if you're early on in your career. Once you've had a, a taste of how to do this, then it won't be as, as important, okay? So I wanna look at rotated teeth, and then I wanna look at blocked out teeth, and then I wanna look at some cuspid considerations. And most of you folks learned cuspid retrieval in seminar five, and as I recall, there was only one case presented in there and it was uh, relatively easy compared to what some of you might run into. So that's another reason I made this uh, presentation. So um, one of my very, very good student doctors sent me a case and it was a revision. He'd been in treatment for 12 months and in 12 months he was trying to rotate or derotate one lower incisor. And at the end of the 12 month period, it looked exactly like it did on day one. And I kind of was blown away by that. And I wrote him back and I said, well, what did you, what were you thinking all these 11 months? Like, was it just gonna magically get better on the 13th month? So um, that's what prompted me to make this presentation in the first place. And so all of you folks know that guy on your left and most of you should know the guy on your right, that's Albert Einstein. So I was hanging out with him one day and we were just, you know, talking shop, doing the thing. And he was reminding me of his definition of insanity. And that's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's exactly what my doctor was doing. He used the same tie in method for 11 straight months. And he was hoping, I guess, number 12 was going to do the trick, but obviously it wasn't going to happen. So during this phase of treatment, you expect to correct rotations. And that's the object of the game here. And if you keep doing the same thing month after month and nothing is happening, doctors use your head. You have to do something different and change it up from what you're doing right now. And if that doesn't work, you know, you can always ask for help too. That's another thing. So um, that's another important part about diagnosis. You have problems. You can always send the case back to me and I'll do my best to help you to figure out what to do with it. And, and you must correct rotation, rotations before you wire progress. You can't do this later. You can't just bypass the tooth. I've seen that done many, many times by students and they say, well, it didn't rotate, I'll do it later. Well, doctor, there is no later. I mean, the time is now to fix rotations while you're on round night tie. It must get done now. So you have to wire progress before you can do mechanics. And that's the thing you guys are all interested in. You know, anytime any of my colleagues or me present a topic on mechanics, everyone's just glued to the board. They're so excited about looking at the spring and the wire and how the teeth move and all that stuff. Uh, but generally, that's not the hard part about a case. The hard part about a case is usually derotating the teeth if it's a severe problem. So uh, I know that's what you're interested in, but you've got to get through this first before you can get to that kind of fun stuff. Okay. And I know, um, you know Dr. Swarup, uh, Dr. Nina Yu, and Dr. Shock all have cast, uh, sorry, lectures about mechanics. And again, they have a very good turnout because that's what's interesting to everybody, but this should be of equal interest to you. 
but only then can you finish and detail the case and get out of there. So stainless steel finishing wire, that's what you're thinking you might do it at the end, does not fix rotations well. So again, doctors, you have to get this done early in the uh, alignment phase. So some principles regarding uh, rotations, and this is Jeff Taylor talking now, not POS. This is my personal preference. Um, you're gonna use a round nye tie to tie it in, the wire to tie into the bracket. I prefer a 014 nye tie for most applications. And doctors, keep in mind, for the first 20 years of my practice, uh, all we had was 016 nye tie, so that's what I used, and it works great, don't get me wrong. It's just I prefer 14 if that's slightly greater flexibility but its longevity is still great, great compared to a 14. You know, a 14 night tie can last for a year or more. A 12 night tie only lasts for one or two months. So that's my logic behind that. But if you want to use 14, excuse me, if you want to use 12, uh, feel free to do that. But again, it's a waste of time on most patients other than a sensitive adult. So sometimes the time, the relationship of the bracket to the wire is difficult or impossible to tie in. And therefore you can't affect any correction because you don't have any deflection. And typical situation is just what I mentioned earlier, a short inner bracket distance, meaning like between lower incisors uh, makes for little or no wire deflection. And the flexibility of any object, uh, as you know from Young's modulus of elasticity or flexural rigidity depends on the span of the wire, the diameter of the material and what the material is made out of. So those are the factors that, that contribute to this. And the span of wire is an important part of that. The diameter in the material is always gonna be your round night tie, but the distance between the two brackets that can change dramatically. But if you can't make any deflection, then you're not gonna get any movement. It's just that simple. So you have to use your head sometimes and do something different. So here you see the operator put a band on that lower bicuspid because it's rotated um, probably you know, 80 degrees or 85 degrees from normal. And uh, the best they could do was get a band on it here. And the wire has zero deflection in it. So you could tie this in until you're old and gray and it's still never gonna derotate that tooth. So at least there's a piece of chain on here that could help spin that tooth. And today, most of you don't have bicuspid bit, uh, fitting bands. So we're gonna have you use a button on either side and then a couple of chains to help spin that tooth around um, putting a bracket in here, would it be that advantageous? So I would have you use a button and save the good IP bracket for later. But you know, principles like that are what we're here to talk about today, okay? And like this example, where there's a bracket on one side and a button on the other, and again, this is Jeff Taylor talking, make space to work. And I love this saying that oral surgeons have, and they say, small incision, small brain, Meaning, you know, if you try and take out a wisdom tooth through like a little four millimeter incision, uh, you're pretty stupid. You need to rip that thing open like it's 50 millimeters so you can get in there and see what you're doing. That's what they usually do. Okay, so uh, to make that space, you're going to pack usually stainless steel open coil on a nigh tie arch wire and blow that space wide open so that you can get auxiliaries on there to get the job done. Then you're going to use chains, as you see here, and this is called a force couple, where each chain is pulling in an opposite direction, but yet the rotation exhibited on the, or exerted on the tooth is the same direction. In this case, it's clockwise. And re-bracket, re-band is needed to obtain a full correction. In other words, like maybe this would be a button, so you might have to change that bracket or change that button into a better position once you get it spun, okay? And you folks are lucky, you're gonna have your molars banded, so they have a cleat on the inside, so that's a nice thing, but you've always got these buttons that you could use. So you're going to have a little inventory of, of those auxiliaries in your practice for this kind of purpose. Okay. And I've drawn a little picture here on a couple of different models. Uh, one is just using these red lines and I'm showing you uh, whether it's a button or a bracket or whatever, you put one chain back to the molar hook and another chain through here, floss it thin, floss back and forth and snap it down underneath the contact and hook it up here to a cuspid and then that'll be a force couple to derotate the tooth very, very effectively. So since I'm not using the night tie coil at all, actually the night tie wire at all to derotate this tooth, it's all being done with chain. And docs, I want you to write this down somewhere. The longer the chain is, the more efficient it will be. So don't put the chain just from the five up to the four, run it up to the three. So it's a longer chain and it will be more efficient that way. And it's the same thing with a coil or a chain. The longer it is, the more efficient it is. 
That's why so many treatment plans have used 12 millimeter nitrite coils versus nine, because the range of activation is longer, similar situation here. So again, you've got to use your head and figure this out. And let's meet this gentleman. And at the start, I think he is 13 years old. And look at this uh, two five in the upper quad here. I mean, in the upper left, um, it's just about as bad as it gets. The buckle is facing the lingual, the lingual is facing the buckle. So it doesn't get, like I said, it doesn't get much worse than this. And I've heard uh, people say, you can never spin that. Um, you should extract it because it's rotated. Uh, you should leave the buckle on the lingual and lingual on the buckle because it's impossible to derotate. And hey, it's just a tooth, you know, it's not that big of a deal. So uh, this gentleman happens to be my nephew, my youngest nephew. So like I tell my sister, you get what you pay for, you're not paying for anything. So I'll do whatever the heck I wanna do with it. Okay. And so to show you again, here's a, a digital cast or a digital representation of the model to show you just how severe it is. And notice that these bicuspids are like an American football. It's uh, much, much wider in a buccal lingual direction than a mesial distal direction. So if you expect to spin that, you're gonna have to blow this space open and make space to work. And remember that was one of my very first tenants back here, open that thing up so you can make space to work. Okay? So here's the sequence of events. Um, at month four of his treatment, my I had packed stainless steel open coil across the four to the six to open the space for the five. So there's plenty of room to work. And then I have my custom fitting bands in the practice. So I had put a band on there. And then why don't you know it, of all the luck, my sister keeps bringing him on the days I'm out of town teaching someplace. So my dental assistants have uh, essentially done the treatment from month one to month three without my help. And here when the patient presents for the treatment, um, they took the band off because it was causing inflammation on his gingiva down there. And so they felt sorry for my nephew. So they took the stuff off and they put a button on there. So my staff took the band off and I had chains on the buckle and the lingual. Then I bonded this button you see to restart the rotation efforts. And I told my sister, I said, uh, don't bring him until you confirm with me that I'm in the office. And I told my staff, I want to see, I want to be there for uh, this retie every time so I can um, start some aggressive derotation effort. But look at what my ladies did in a scant four months. They got a 90 degree correction of rotation. That's really good. And you can see again, the space was made between the four and the six by packing stainless steel coil on a night high arch wire. And yeah, there's some derotation of the six here and maybe a little, I mean, some rotation of the six and so forth, but hey, I've got to get that thing spun before I go on if I want to get this job done correctly. Okay, so now what has been done? Okay, I hooked one button. I hooked one button on the um, buckle because I couldn't get one on the lingual. Then I took a piece of chain from that button and notice I pulled it all the way up here to the cuspid. So remember, the longer the chain, the more efficient it is. Then there's another piece of chain, same button, pass it underneath the arch wire. And then again, docs, stretch it out, floss it back and forth underneath the contact, pull that back and hook it onto this six cleat. So I made this lingual chain a little bit stronger so that I could pull it away so I could get a button on that side. So this one is super tight and this one is just tight. So now we'll see what happens when the patient comes back. Okay. So again, notice a pretty conservative method done by my dental assistants because I didn't want to hurt my nephew, but hey, my dental assistants are really good. So they did a nice job. So let's see what happens when we come back. Wow, look at that. That's a tremendous amount of improvement in just 30 days. In fact, it's almost completely spun back around. So <clears throat> now I was able to put a button on the inside, the lingual surface of that and keep the same button on the buckle. Now replace the chains, you know, they wear out in about two weeks, but normally we just have them back every month so that you don't disrupt your schedule too much. Same chain from buckle up to the three, same chain from the lingual cleat all the way, excuse me, the lingual button up to the lingual cleat on the six right there. And now trying to think, how can I get more force to spin this tooth more efficiently? I already have two chains on there. And then I got the idea, well, hey, why don't we, take a piece of chain, floss it between the six and the seven, hook it onto the button here, and then pull it like super tight underneath the hook all the way up to right there. So that's what the third chain is doing. Okay. 
and let me draw the little chain path for you so you can see where it is. Uh, that's what it looks like in blue. You can't really see it because it goes down there between the six and the seven. And yes, doctors, the gingiva will be really, really inflamed. And you pull that, that chain out of there and it's like a little geyser of blood flies out uh, because the chain packs so much plaque and calculus in it. But hey, you know, oral cavity tissue of the gingiva heals in about seven days anyway, no matter what you do to it. So that won't be an issue. And number two, the thing that scares the daylights out of you and scares the daylights out of me too when I started was this tooth exhibits unbelievable mobility. And I'm talking like a plus three mobility. And when you take the chains off there, you think, gee, don't stand up because if you stand up, uh, you know, the tooth is going to fall out of your head. It's so loose. And another thing that's uh, scary is it is hypersensitive. So many times the patient will not let you touch them until you use anesthetic and get it numb. And then this gentleman has a really high pain threshold. So he's like, no problem. But I've had other patients where they say, oh, don't even touch me. Just go ahead and get it numb right now before you do anything else. And they just accept the fact that they have to get numb to change this chain. Okay, so that's month five. Now let's see what happens in a scant 30 days later. And again, showing you the picture. Uh, I adjusted the tension so that I would have more uh, tension from the lingual to kind of pull it back toward the middle. And then at month six, all good. Look at that tremendous amount of inflammation behind that gingiva right there. So that that's what happens when you have chain going across that area. But the rotation or the derotation effort is now complete, but the tooth isn't extruded enough. And look at the deleterious action on the molar. So you've got these things that will scare you. The molar rotation, the extreme mobility of the tooth, the hypersensitivity of the tooth, and the fact that sometimes it's hard to figure out what to do with the chains. But these three things usually scare beginning docs, but you just have to have some faith that it's going to work out and it will work out. Okay, so now um, another situation. I never read that in the textbook or anything else. I mean, I just thought of it sitting there at the chair and I have this thing, I call it junk bracket. And uh, it's a, another bracket system, not IP brackets. You can tell it's not this IP thing, it's something different. So I don't care if it was a button or a bracket or a lower incisor, whatever you want to put on there is fine with me. And then I have to do something to make, uh, to make deflection in the wire. Because if you were look carefully right here, if you put this wire in the slots, you would get no deflection whatsoever. And you'd be actually holding the tooth up and not making it come into the arch more. Remember, I'm trying to achieve uh, a bracket slot to cusp tip height of four millimeters. There's no way I can get that on here yet. So I'm trying to extrude it into the arch as efficiently as I possibly can so that I can get my bracket on there at the correct height, okay? At the correct height. So take a periapical to make sure there's no resorption whatsoever. Um, we haven't lined up the root yet, so that's not a problem. It's just checking it to make sure. And can you all see, you all, I keep thinking I'm talking to a class, I apologize. Can you, doctor, see the thickness of the PDL right here? Um, and it's that PDL that's full of osteoid uh, because osteoid turns into bone and that's what makes that tooth be a plus three mobility. And they tighten up usually within a 30 day period, but they're unbelievably loose when you are doing this severe rotation. But you're not causing any banging into cortical plates or anything. You're just spinning the root in the, in the bone. So it doesn't cause any harm to the roots. I've never seen any problem with it. So I know it seems kind of scary, but it works out just fine. So here's kind of the overall hierarchy. And doctors, when you send your case uh, to me for diagnosis, this is the kind of thing I'm gonna outline for you exactly how to do that. I'm not gonna expect you to remember that. I'll probably even put a picture like this in there to remind you how to run the chains and do that kind of thing. Because in the beginning, you don't know that. Um, just like I didn't know that, I had to just sit there and figure it out on my own about how I could get the thing spun and how to get it down and how to get it in and so on and so forth. So. Um, you just have to use your head. Plus, you know, we'll help you, but I will give you extra help because I don't expect you to know these things off the top of your head. So look at what happened 30 days later. That's a beautiful thing. It came into the arch wonderfully. Now you can get the bracket at the right height. This one may have intruded a tad, 
because of that night all night null force but hey don't worry about it. it'll come right back anyway so it's not a problem so that doesn't scare me at all that might concern you guys in the beginning but it doesn't bother me whatsoever so now you pop that bracket off and put the ip bracket on there and away you go oh docs keep in mind this is the this is the flexi bonding retractor and the older ones were blue like that instead of white like yours today but these things work so well that I just use these for photo retractors and everything else because that shape is so great. So again, Jeff Taylor talking, I, I had found nothing better than that product from Progressive Dental Supply, a flexi bonding retractor. Okay, so now we're ready to put the bracket on and there's the IP bracket. You've had that on the card now for seven months waiting for this day so you could use it. Bracket height is correct at four millimeters and now you can get to work and do the rest of the case. But as you saw earlier, the rest of the case was totally, you know, lackluster. And here, molar derotated back to where it was supposed to be. So that the four, everything is good. Look at the gingivus, perfect. Everything healed up nicely. And the tooth is all solid again. So not to worry, okay? So finish out the case. And here we are at 19 months. Notice nice tight interdigitation of the teeth. Everything looks great. Marginal ridges are all consistent, really good. There's one band space left over that's normal and PDL all back to normal, apex totally perfect, everything good, so not a problem, all right? So again, a pretty short treatment time, but again, where people would say something like that was impossible, uh, it's not impossible, it's just a matter of time to get that thing derotated. Okay. And I live in Huntington Beach, uh, my practice is in Laguna Niguel, California, and Huntington Beach is the surf capital of the world, so all three of my nephews are super big water polo guys, super big surfers and that kind of stuff. So here he is after a game. And uh, my sister wasn't too creative with the names. This guy's name is um, Jeffrey Taylor Poff. So um, she kind of likes those two names together, I guess. Okay. So you look at something like that and you just think, oh my gosh, how would I ever solve that problem? You've got a transposition and severe crowding and all kinds of stuff. But Hey, you know, this case wouldn't be bad if you could tolerate taking out the upper first buys because then the C's would go. This is the baby cuspid and then the four could be extracted. Well, then it's an easy matter. Just push the three up here, bring the five in and the same thing here. Now, the transposition, <laughs> that would be a very, very difficult thing. I'm saying it's doable, but it would be a very difficult thing. Um, we have a case from the Philippine Clinic. A uh, young guy's name is Carl and it's a transposition case for one cuspid and it took just about four and a half years to do it. Uh, but still, I mean, it's just a matter of time. It can be done. It's not like something is impossible, but I certainly wouldn't want a case like this, a true transposition as your first or second case, you're gonna be too frustrated. So docs, I want you to take cases that are say, uh, people between the ages of eight and 15, and I'd like them to be relatively simple, mild, moderate crowding, mild, moderate class two or class three, that kind of thing. Try not to take mutilated adults in really difficult cases because, you know, you're going to end up with uh, a really bad taste in your mouth, so to speak, for ortho uh, if you start off with some really difficult cases to do. But if that's all you have, you know, all of us would be happy to support you and I'll do the best I can when you send me the case for diagnosis. Um, but I'm telling you, you're a lot better off to do young people than adults. Okay. So in a situation like this, Again, that might scare the daylights out of you. And docs, the big, the big problem I see is most general dentists would look at this and they'd say, oh my God, I have to extract a lower incisor to make this fit. And it's the only way on earth it's gonna work and blah, blah, blah. And you're thinking, gee, which one should I take? I'll take out this, this central right here and I'll just line these up and live happily ever, happily ever after. And that's so not true doctors. Um, this case is probably gonna be a non-extraction case. It's just simply a matter of we have to make the space by expansion in the four or five area. And then that'll allow room for these things to line up. And, and you need a whole picture. You need all the diagnostic records. You need a staff, a pad, a models, all that photograph, patient balance, everything else. What's the lip support like, lip incompetency and all that. You can't just look at an arch and say extract or non-extract. You have to have full complete records for every case. And I like this, uh, Don McGann used to always say, um, if you're going to put one bracket on a case, then you don't need full records. But if you put two brackets on a case, all of a sudden now it's an ortho case. Now you need full records. So it doesn't matter how old they are or anything else. But I remember don't jump the gun about a decision until you have all the information. 
But unraveling this, simple. It's just a matter of you start packing coil from the cuspid to the central and the central to the cuspid. And these will advance. This whole area will expand based on that coil force. And you just keep packing the coil, keep making the space until you can bring the laterals out, double over tie back to them, and you can get this lined up. So with that comment, let's go look at another simple case. And this is a POS case 625. And he came from the Philippine clinic. And I'm not going to show you the whole case. I just want to show you the, the highlights of it. But he's a pretty dramatic situation. And I took a picture here about the, the blocked out, blocked out 4-2 completely to the lingual. And you can see his hygiene is terrible. But even somebody with good dexterity would have a hard time cleaning back there since the teeth are so jumbled up. And this would be another classic situation where you would think, oh my gosh, I have to take out that lower incisor right there to get this to line up. And doctors, that's erroneous thinking. You've got a crossbite in the upper lateral and severe, severe crowding in here. And if you count this from mesial six to mesial six, you'll see this gentleman has almost 16 millimeters of crowding in that lower arch. And here we did a full workup on him and it was determined that he could not tolerate eight millimeters of incisor advancement. So we're gonna take out bicuspids and we're gonna take out fours and then we're going to uh, bring those teeth in the arch. And again, I know what you're thinking or what you should be thinking is maybe you wanna take out that lateral instead, but fours is a much better option, keeping all four incisors and keeping the number of teeth symmetrical upper to lower. So he's gonna have upper and lower fours removed. And here's another thing, docs, you might not consider in the beginning of your career, when you take out bicuspids for crowding like this, the cuspid is going to move to the distal. And if the cuspids move to the distal, the class two is going to get worse. So he might be a class one right now, but when you take out four buys, excuse me, two buys on the lower, he's going to turn into a class two, which is why you have to take out upper bicuspids. So there's so many things to worry about in ortho or so many things to consider, I should say which makes it so much more interesting than any other aspect of dentistry. You know, like an occlusal composite, you know, you really don't have to think about that too much. You can kind of do that with your eyes closed. Same with a crown prep and endo's a little more exciting, but um, ortho is the top of the line because you always have to think, think, think every single appointment about what to do. Okay, so let's press on with the treatment. So we are going to ban a bond the case. And over there in the Philippines, there's a ton of dental schools and it seems like everybody has a brother or a cousin or a sister or somebody that went to dental school and they're going to have that person take out the teeth uh, because they'll do it for free. So as a signal to that doctor, we're going to leave the brackets off of the fours. So it would take an absolute moron to extract, say, a five sitting next to a four that doesn't have a bracket on it. So it's a pretty good message to the, the dentist or the doctor or the surgeon or whomever that's going to take out the teeth that that's the one you want extracted. So we're getting it all ready here for extraction. And we even jumped the gun a little bit, packing some coil across here to open up space for that lateral. And chances are high, you couldn't even bracket that in the right position. So just leave that bracket on the card for right now till you open up some space. That lower laterals back here, you can't even touch that one. So you don't have that one bracketed yet. All right, so let's see what happens. The fours go away and then we go to 12 nitai for a month because he's a grown up, and then 14 nitai, that's my favorite setup. And now we just have to bring the teeth into alignment. So instead of just sitting here waiting for something to happen, you have to make something happen. So look at what's going on here, doctors. You've got open coil from the cuspid to the central and open coil from the cuspid to the central right here. And both of those are gonna push the cuspids to the distal and advance the incisors and you can't control which way they go, so don't worry about it. You know, just like the weather, you can't control the weather, so if it rains, you take an umbrella, you can't stop it, you just have to deal with it. Okay? And you know, I used to say you can't control women or weather, but I got in trouble for saying that, so I can't do that anymore, sorry. And I wish you were here live so I could ask you, what kind of coil is that? What, it's, what is it made out of? And there's no wrong answer. It could be steel or it could be nighttime because you're only pushing on one tooth. There's no four behind this and there's no four behind that. So Nitai coil moves one, two, so that would work too. Personally, I would have you use stainless steel coil and get in there and be aggressive and open that up. 
I could even make this more efficient yet. I would have you take four holes of regular chain and go from the cuspid all the way, excuse me, the molar all the way to the cuspid. So one hole per tooth, regular chain and pull and push the cuspid back at the same time. And the cuspids are gonna tip back, making room for that lateral, but that's perfectly fine because this wire just has to fix rotations. It's not fixing root alignment. So you don't have to worry about that uh, right now. You just wanna get that lateral lined up, okay? So aggressively pack the coil, add some chain, and here comes the space. So five months, what was that last uh, retie? It was only three months. So skip a month and here we go. Hey, look at that. Now the lateral and the upper uh, has enough room. It could probably come in by itself. Now look at the inner bracket distance from here to here. You can see this is much greater than in the lower arch from here to here. Everybody, I mean, everybody, do you, can you see that doctor? So again, that's why upper teeth will align faster than lower teeth because of the bigger inner bracket distance. Now things that scare you in the beginning, just like on that last case, you're gonna drive this thing into crossbite before you ever get that lateral in there. And then you're going to think, oh my God, I've done the crossbite. How am I going to get it back? And what about his gingiva and all this other stuff? But hey, don't even worry about it. It's just got to get done. So get it done. All right, so we'll press on, continue to pack the coil in the bottom. And 30 days later, it's looking good. We're getting there. Now you could probably bracket this. And notice now you have the tooth is roughly aligned, but the root is way back there. So uh, it's an old case. We didn't have 18 by 25 heat wire back then. Excuse me. We only had this uh, was a braided night and all wire that was super flexible with the concept of trying to uh, make torque. It was called turbo wire. It didn't work very well. I don't even know if you can buy it anymore, but today you have heat activated night tie and it's by far the, it's the Rolls Royce of, of correcting root positions. Look at the tissue height from right to left and you can see how much shorter this one is because the roots on the pallet. Okay, back, back to work on this. The cuspid is getting pushed back. So now you can put a bracket on the lateral. And if you can bracket that lateral correctly, do so now and then double over tie back to that. And if you've forgotten how to do a double over tie, you can go into SmileStream library and I've put two documents in there for you. One's a JPEG and one's a PowerPoint. So the JPEG you can print and put on the back of the cabinet door to remind you of how to do this and the PowerPoint you could use to teach your staff or teach yourself, I should say, how to do the double overtie. And then you're being super efficient in that you are bringing the tooth into the arch as you are making the space. So it doesn't get much better than that, right? So hey, it was a tough case, but you made pretty good progress in six months time. Okay. And then the 4-2 bracket was added. And now would be the perfect time to double overtie back to it. And you just keep going. Ah, but look at this, the cuspid is now in crossbite. So I could imagine beginning doctors would get all excited about that and be super concerned and really worried because of that crossbite. But hey, don't get excited. You have to get this job done, okay? So there's the crossbite I was talking about. And this is an excellent picture. Again, sorry about my voice. This is an excellent picture to talk about when you take that coil off, I want there to be an extra one millimeter of space right here, just like you see there, because the minute you take the coil away, what do you think is happening? And it's called relapse. And that means that cuspid is going to move back into that space and the cut, the ladder, excuse me, the incisors will come back and the space might close on itself. So aggressively pack the coil and open it bigger than what you need by a millimeter, then remove the coil, then aggressively tie back to the tooth and bring it into position. So again, you guys are worried about the gingival problem, but that's nothing because it's just simple tipping. It's not bodily movement, slamming it into the, the cortical plate or anything. And you're worried about the crossbite, but hey, uh, you know, every force has an equal and opposite reaction. So as this comes out, this one goes in. So 30 days later, you're gonna see the crossbite got fixed. Everything is right back to normal and no one's ever gonna know that it was in crossbite except you, okay? And again, mobility is pretty severe, especially on those cuspids like that. And that'll scare you as well, but don't be scared. Uh, it's going to work out just fine. So 16 Naitai, again, it could have been left as a 14 logic unknown. Let's press on at month nine. Hey, look at that. Now the tooth has brought into line and the crossbite is gone. Oops, crossbite is gone. And now you can proceed on. Now we have to have a labial torque bracket in the bottom 
again, because it was stuck on the pallet. All these are going to be lingual torque brackets for the mechanics, but that'll be a labial torque bracket because of a, the root being back on the, the inside or blocked to the lingual, as we say. Okay, so now the rest of the case is very uneventful, so we don't need to look at the rest of that, but I just wanted to show you how you can make space, and I showed you an example of doing it non-extraction and then doing it with extraction, but either way, uh, you've got to get those teeth lined up and remember the basic rules. Make space to work, add auxiliaries as necessary to do that, derotate it as efficiently as you can and or deflect the wire and double over tie back to it to get the tooth to come into the arch as quickly as possible. And again, I wanna talk about that efficiency factor. Uh, the patient heard you tell them it was gonna be 24 months or whatever it was. And you know, if you mess around trying to get something lined up for a year and a half and you haven't even done mechanics or you haven't done anything else yet, you're gonna be behind and the patient's going, hey, 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 you told me two years and I wanna get out of these braces now. So you have to respect the patient's wishes. The other the situation that doesn't really apply to that is in the Netherlands, they don't necessarily get paid by the treatment plan. They get paid by the number of months that they see the patient. So they're kind of happy to extend the treatment plan the time, but unless things have changed now. So, all right, so let's uh, stop this one now and you guys can take a break and then come back and watch part two with the cuspid cases or do it on another day or, or whatever. But I hope that was helpful as far as lining up your uh, incisors and lining up the teeth as more as efficiently as you possibly can. And as I keep repeating, when you send me the case, I'm going to try and give you all the hints I can think of to help you derotate the tooth, the teeth to get it uh, in the fastest possible time. Cuspid retrieval is another one that's that can be very, very time consuming. And those of you who've ever done a derotation of a cuspid that giant, giant root surface area of an upper cuspid makes them really, really hard to derotate. So that's another consideration too. Okay, docs, again, I wanna, a doctor, I'm so sorry, I'm so used to saying that for 35 years, I can't stop. So thank you, doctor, for watching. And I hope you like this one and I hope you like uh, part two. So see you soon.